Hello, hello everyone. Uh, thank you for joining in. Today, uh, we are bringing you another webinar on the policy space in India. And this is one I'm personally most excited about as well, because today we are gonna do a deep dive and delve into you know, different aspects of the policy space, right? And how do you build careers here, right? How do these spaces, verticals function, right? What their own nuances are. And we have an absolute star cast, uh, so to speak of, you know, panelists today. So uh, like we have folks who have made their entire careers in the dev sector, in consulting and, you know, in policy implementation and so on and so forth, right? Uh, even before we get started, right? Uh, if I have to give a one line intro to our guests, although we'll have all details in the show notes and, you know, link to their profiles, you can definitely, you should definitely look them up. But we have Shruti who kindly, you know, fun, uh, works as a director, HR director at Teach for India. Right. We have Antara who works with uh, Price for a Cooper House currently, and especially in you know, the employment generation consulting space. We have Sanjana who's currently with the ministry. Uh, she works for the government of India in a re research role. And we have Sharang who's had a long career in consulting, in policy consulting, and currently also works as you know, an independent policy consultant. And I'm your host. My name is Yash. I currently run and lead PPI, and I also work at Twitter in a policy role. And without any further ado, we'll you know, quickly get started. I want to share, you know, share the first question to with to Sharang to begin with, if you were to define it, Sharang, what is public policy consulting, right? And if very quickly I could ask you, how does one get started here? Okay, uh, so I think there are two parts to policy consulting, and I think there's a. I'd first like to differentiate two things. So uh, generally, when you when you talk about policy consulting, there are two types of roles, especially uh, essentially. There's one which Antras also uh, does, which is more what I call more government advisory where basically the government is your client and you're focusing on advising how to build out policies or how to implement them, right. one of the two. Uh, what I do is slightly different or what I did actually is slightly different. It is uh, advising private clients on how they should build their government relations strategy. So both require different skills. I'll let Anthra get into the other side of it. But when you talk about advocacy, basically, what uh, there are two parts to it. And essentially, it's about two things. It's about people and it's about systems it's about understanding what you want to say to the government and finding the right ways to say that essentially it's a lot of communications that's involved and of course what backs that up is essentially research like really understanding the gaps within a specific sector and that's how you kind of go about it so in consulting you're basically managing your client you're understanding their expectations what their needs are and trying to focus on how you can build their relationship up with the government as simple as that uh, what was the second question? How do you break in? Yeah. Is that, was that the question? Yeah. Uh, I think it's pretty easy to break in. I don't think there's any specific skill set required. Uh, I feel like I didn't, I had no idea what I was getting into when I got into it actually, uh, and learned everything on the job actually, uh, you need to write well, you need to understand how to research, you know, how to, you need to know how to deal with people, especially. And you need to communicate yourself well. I think these four things kind of come together. So there's no specific requirement. It's a lot of picking stuff up on the job, if you ask me. Couldn't, couldn't agree more, especially with the part of you know being a people's person and communication. Maybe if we just uh, jump on uh, next, you know, uh, just continue on that, Antara. Uh, and I'm, I'm framing this in a particular manner because this is the manner we, in which we get this question a lot, which is if I want to break in into you know a big four, right? Especially in a government advisory or a public sector role. Are there any specifics one has to keep in mind or build up a resume accordingly? Like, is this something that you've noticed? Yeah, so no tangible hard skills, I would say, like what Sharon said, apart from, uh, of course, Excel and PowerPoint, those are your two uh, key tools that you really need to um, have a decent knowledge of. I'm not even saying good knowledge. But yes, uh, on the job, you pick up your communication skills, uh, secondary research, yes, very important ability to articulate that research. And of course, uh, stakeholder management across the board, it could be right from, uh, you know, your client who is in my case, like the public sector, uh, whichever agency that is, and your uh, people at the other side of the spectrum as well, like the beneficiaries. So you need to be able to uh, do that very, very well. So yes, these are the key things. And there's no sort of, uh, like Sharan said, no real barrier that I see, um, you know, to breaking into the space, even as a fresher. You just have to uh, be able to put a foot in the door. And once you get that interview, it's more about how you present yourself. That's that's about it. Awesome. Uh, Sanjana, I'm going to start with a very difficult, but honestly, also a question I'm very personally uh, interested in knowing better, which is, 
data mm-hmm. and the government right uh with your extensive experience of you know having worked in the space and in in a research role and of course you know using data day in and out for different kinds of outcomes how how have you seen this play out in the sense i'm sure you can't get into specific but like you know the the policy choices that the government makes right uh, the decisions and the inputs that go into that is a lot of it is is a lot of it data driven is a lot of it research driven or is a lot of it just you know driven by political impulses or the political economy of the day like how, how have you seen that play out well first of all like all government schemes right now are um based on data there are huge management information systems or mis is that you know like basically are the backbone of every system so you're collecting data at every level and huge amounts of it and there are huge ecosystems that are built around that whether it is apps that people field workers are using to feed in data whether it is data entry operators who are whether it's at the gram panchayat level or block level or district level who are feeding in paper based data into an online format whether there are mis managers who are taking on a broader view and doing some analytics um there are statistical officers uh, in the government who are actually supposed to take up and analyze all of this data and this sort of like framework gets replicated as you go up to every level so this will be there at the district level as you go to the state level there will be a state level mis manager statistical officers who are looking at all of these uh, data analytics for the entire state and then as you go further up there will be someone at the scheme level or at the a uh, program level and then a uh, department level and then ministry level so where i'm sitting right now um i'm sitting in the ministry of rural development sort of in between different programs uh and project divisions of the ministry itself and in my past experience working at different levels of the government i've had to engage with these infrastructures and these processes of data and government at every level and it's been an area of interest not just while implementing different government programs but also as a research area that i have focused on both outside the government in my role uh, with the accountability initiative at the center for policy research and right now uh, more in depth uh, at the ministry of rural development and you see data you know it can be anything from someone taking a table made on a piece of paper and figuring out how to interpret that to someone engaging with data and like sharing data updates on a whatsapp group which is a huge part of like how the government functions today right their data requests going day in day out every second uh you know people communicating different updates uh pendencies in the government you know whatsapp groups form a huge part of that parallel systems that work on these uh mis's and then more overarching analytics that even agencies like niti ayog can do something that they can take into account projections they can do rankings and um the team that i'm currently working with is now looking at emerging technologies in the government looking at the use of machine learning and artificial intelligence and seeing how can we not just you know build these technologies and build tools using them in house in the government because previously a lot of this expertise has resided outside of the government and the government has had to contract out uh in order to uh, build such tools but how can we build these in house and how can we also build in um knowledge on how to evaluate this right so how can a is officer who's a generalist be able to have a conversation around that because yeah. these are people who are in a post for a couple of years and will get transferred out these are not people who have in depth expertise so part of my work right now is not only studying the culture around datafication or uh, culture around evaluation using data culture around using digital technologies as solutions but also to then use that learning to improve capacity within the government whether it can be anything as simple as you know uh, calculating summary statistics on excel you know um how can you push someone from using sum to using a function like sum if on excel you know just that one extra push yeah. that can change the way that someone can analyze data teaching someone uh, how to make better data visualizations because you know at a higher level in government presentations are how you communicate 
so we are also trying to bridge this gap between the everyday practice of data in government which is this right which is how you share data on whatsapp which is how you use an app which is how you use excel and this more broader fancier sexier idea of data as ai as machine learning because unless you have that simple data in place none of these fancier things you're building can like you know have anything to stand on until you have the basics in place yeah. so that's the shift i'm seeing and uh, you know i'm seeing data scientists get recruited into the government data engineers get recruited uh, gis specialists so it's a fascinating space uh, to see all of this happen from the inside that's that's a very wonderful insight uh, sanjana like and that to in that uh, we'll come on to you uh, on with the shruti and i don't think of of a person better suited to answer this because of you know of your current role but also of your experience in dev sector in general which is if someone wants to build a career in the development sector and i understand it's very vast and varied and there's no one answer which can solve for everything but what are the skills that you look for what are the maybe maybe is there a certain career trajectory you look for a certain kind of a background you look for what is it that you look for if you're hiring for someone for a dev sector role uh so i'm going to try to some like pinpoint that because also it goes there's a, there's a standardized answer i'm going to give you which is yep. my disclaimer and then it gets very nuanced based on where in the dev sector you are yep. um because if you look at the dev sector in general it's not just a non profit you do have people who doing program delivery and there's a certain skill and competency that's really important for that that yep. also comes with the demands of like okay pace location uh and and language all of that you also have people who are enablers uh and i think sharan touched upon this earlier a lot of the partnerships advisory you have uh philanthropy you have consultancy think tanks mne data there's enablers to doing what you do and then you have policy as well which is advised by a lot of this so in each space i think there'll be very different skills that you have to have strengths for and apply largely what i've seen i think similar to a lot of folks in this group minus sanjana i think you have a lot more technical background but i was kind of a generalist i came in and learned on the job and a big thing i think about just making it is understanding what the transferable skill is and then being able to apply it as well um project management and communication i think across the board is stuff that people are using uh, and that i think for at least getting into the sector that coupled with a problem solving kind of mindset and ability to understand the root cause think innovatively about a problem um i think those three if if you're able to just harness those and practice those you can kind of fit yourself into any job across the ecosystem and then grow from there and then as you grow you'll start to i think answer questions about what's the context i want to work in is there a geographic lens i want um is there a particular function i care about am i driven by a particular issue and then within that like i said in the ecosystem you'll find also the space in that impact value chain you want to be in so uh in a roundabout way i think i'm going back to what a lot of panelists have already said which is it's transferable skills and it's a lot of learning and reflecting and growing on the job this very helpful shruti if i can ask you this uh, antra just you know again building on the conversation we were having which is uh again just how common this question is as well that if i want to work in a consulting role right had a big four in india even if you can of course you know get into specifics but how are these teams like what are the verticals how are these teams aligned uh and is there a particular particular kind of you know maybe say background they prefer maybe they prefer someone has an econ background something like how if if i am a second year student right or a third year student and just trying to i have that year or two just to figure out and shape my trajectory in a sense right what's the best advice you could get yeah i'll just take a step back from that and say that uh, public sector consulting or even in general consulting overall doesn't really have a trajectory like you have for engineering or medicine or law right uh, no one talks about consulting in schools when i was in school i don't know what it the case is right now uh i understood or like you know googled consulting maybe sometime when i was in college and then at the young india fellowship as well uh as a college student and okay coming back to you know how these uh, firms are structured so in terms of the big four uh public sector consulting especially which is right now called management consulting by the way overall uh they do have a sector focus there's economic advisory there's infrastructure advisory there's agriculture social uh there's a skills team all of those things uh exist 
there's something separate for automobiles there's a people and organization so there's yes a lot of uh, sort of vertical uh, specific sector specific focus that is there and yes uh, you know depending on these sectors for example the agriculture team would prefer someone who has uh, done like a niche uh, mba from the irmas of the world or uh, you know like a basically a uh, masters in rural management uh, which is quite common nowadays is what i hear uh, someone from the people and organization looking to recruit would probably look at someone with a psychology background or even a background in higher education per se right i've seen uh, things happen across the spectrum but uh, if i take into account my own example uh, i did my undergraduation in uh, biotechnology and then i did a year of liberal arts at the young india fellowship so i am uh, completely a generalist and the sub sector that i work in which is startups entrepreneurship innovation skill development it sort of cuts across all these different verticals so for the last 5 years i've been serving as a subject matter expert across these uh, different business units okay. so i if i have to like really get to the crux of it uh, i would say that uh, you know it's better in my opinion it's better to be a generalist uh, at the beginning of your career uh you can go on to find your niche but it's better to get as much exposure across sectors across niche sectors not so niche sectors but just uh, get as much exposure work on as many diverse uh, cases or studies whatever they are called uh, you know uh, in the early stages of your career which gives you a lot of um, broad based uh, and makes you better prepared to you know specialize or not specialize later on so yes that's that's just uh, what i feel about this entire piece yeah i'll just build on that sharing and especially because this is a conversation you and i have had multiple times but i was still love you to elucidate which is uh, a very common question actually right that hey i i studied history for my undergrad right and i have no background at all of say tech sector consulting or even say something in gender or health and so on and so forth uh but if i am to get into policy consulting right? especially the kind that you and i were uh, a part of we have clients from across sectoral focus areas right so does that lack of academic background work as a hindrance and if not then how how do you work your way around it uh so i don't think it's a hindrance like actually best example would be you know vikram and you know utra uh utra yeah. is the head of policy for snapchat in india she has a sociology degree yeah. uh nothing to do with technology Vikram has a history degree, actually, if I remember correctly, and he is again in Amazon managing policy over there. Again, AWS doing like financial and data stuff. I'm sure. The whole idea is that you're coming from a very different background, and there are, again, like, okay, I'll break it up into two kinds of things. There's number one knowledge that you end up picking up, which is your sectoral knowledge. So history will be like, well, not really sectoral knowledge, but it's a base. Uh. so tech is a sector healthcare is a sector energy is a sector and those things you kind of build out of course there's an advantage if you already did your degree in them and you already understood and created that knowledge base for yourself yeah. but over and above that are the skills that you're using on a daily basis which are i'd already mentioned so if you're good with your skills and you're able to pick up the knowledge well enough and able to get to the first principles of something so that you understand the sector i don't think it's that much of a challenge yeah your learning curve it might take you slightly longer to get there you might want to work a little harder before your interviews right. but if you can showcase that i mean no nothing like it and it's not that hard to break in there absolutely yeah. uh, in fact i'll just add one thing to you know what shang had said already in having been there year back which is it's all learnable it's genuinely far simpler than we think then you know uh, it's all knowledge that you can acquire fairly simply but but uh before this conversation uh you know we asked our audiences what are the question that they would love for you to answer and the most common question by far and this for you sanjana which is how do you break into a role with the government of india without the is route if you can just walk us through that yeah sure so i mean of course even the is is just one of the many uh permanent position that uh, that the government has and of course there are a variety of different examinations at the state and the central level um that people can sit for for a variety of positions um but if you don't want to go through the examination route or if that hasn't worked out for you like there are many different um contractual and consultants or uh, consultant type workers that the government engages with and um 
uh, they're both like people who are hired directly by government and work within government as well as people who may be hired through a third party work within government or completely work separately but engage deeply with the government so um, some of it is like what Antara was talking about. A lot of uh, management consultants are hired to work with the government. Uh, management consulting firms uh, form project of uh, program management units um, at different levels of the government and take on a lot of M&E uh, related work, operational work, data analysis and things like that. So that's one way uh, to go through it. And I'm sure Antara can also expand more on that. But as um, a, a beginner, in the field, someone who's right out of college, um, some of the roles that are open to you and something that can even help you to figure out whether you want to dedicate that time and energy um, to sitting for these government exams and can even enrich your knowledge base and experience to be able to uh, flourish in that and then do well in your interview also. Um, so for things like the UPSC, uh, you know, young professional programs uh, that different ministries and agencies have. Um, these are advertised on government websites and are fairly frequent um, and have like a clear uh, outline of what is required. And okay. these are often generalist positions and you can apply for them. Um, different departments also have internships available. And then there are a variety of fellowship programs um, that are both run directly by the government as well as by other um, third party or uh, philanthropic organizations or development organizations that partner with the government uh, to do these. And if you're interested in development and rural development and working closely with the government, I think it's a great experience. Um, it's something that I also did. Um, I work with the Ministry of Drinking Water and Sanitation on implementing a uh, Swachh Bharat uh, mission at the district and block levels and below. And um, you know, for someone like me who had an interest in studying bureaucracy, studying how people work within the bureaucracy, how last mile service delivery takes place, like it was an excellent way to kind of jump in right into the middle of things and see how like, you know, one of the country's biggest programs is implemented, uh, you know, something where there's all the political will in the world, the prime minister's talking about it every day, you know, there's no dearth of funding or so it seems and, and to see how does that play out, you know, like, and uh, those are some learnings that, you know, I, I draw on on a daily basis. Um, I did that in 2017-18. And it's something that I think about every day, even right now. And I think it's a big advantage for me um, sitting right now at the government of India level, having that knowledge of what happens at the absolute last mile of delivery when a government employee is interacting with a beneficiary, when a government employee is talking to a household member who does not have any identity card you know how how do those scenarios play out and it can help you to strengthen how you build out technologies for the government how you think about policy making for the government how you think about evaluation for the government and um, so there are these different and i think what well, this fellowship route there are you know plenty of these fellowships available and the barrier to entry is much lower than it is even for the young professional programs or for the other consultant roles. Um, but something to think about is like these, these roles, these contractual and consultant positions like aren't the typical like government job that you hear about, right? You don't have, it's not a permanent position. You don't have guaranteed promotions. You don't have guaranteed raises. You don't have guaranteed vacations, right? So it's, it's a risk and most of these are like short term positions. So if it's something that you want to do to like get a sense of what you're going to be getting into and to see if right. it's for you right. and uh, something that you want to do before you commit to say going to a graduate school or a PhD program related to this area, then it's a great way as like a stepping stone to figure out what you want to do. But on the other hand, the government also hires long-term contracted employees, right? Um, you know, because the process of hiring in the government is so difficult, some people are hired on government contracts and can be in that position for 20 years. Um, and now you have, uh, you know, this lateral entry thing also coming up. So if now, if that's uh, an interesting option for people who later in their career want to come into government. So someone who already has sectoral expertise of 5, 10, 15 years, um, you know, and uh, a higher education degree in that space. And now you're thinking about how can I join into the public sector? So these are the two routes, like as a fresher, and then someone who already has that expertise um, that you can find to come in without going through the examinations. Yeah. If I can very uh, quickly just, you know, follow up on that, Sanjana, which is, 
how do you grow up the ladder in these roles or if at all if that's a possibility um so say for example in the fellowship these are short term like predefined roles right but for example in a swachh bharat that was such a huge uh, such a huge program and there were fellows placed in almost every district of the country that the fellowship itself had to evolve ways uh, to manage itself right right and that was not something that was preplanned but from within the fellows we also within our state groups had to figure out how do we manage ourselves how do we uh you know uh, collaborate and negotiate with our go- other government bodies so say some of us fellows would decided okay maybe perhaps some of us should be working at the state level or perhaps some of the fellow representative should be a uh, working at the ministry level and so some of those things like evolved over time and then other fellowship programs learned from that and replicated it so uh, there was um, the nutrition fellowship program so that learned from the swachh bharat one and then uh, also had these positions available at the state and the central levels um, similarly the aspirational district uh, fellowship program also yeah. uh, took some of these learnings um, and uh, i think uh, the punjab government has a fellowship program yeah. um that also has a combination of these things there are district level fellows as well as people who are posted at the state government level i think the haryana program also has something similar um andhra pradesh uh, madhya pradesh government also has a combination of these kinds of roles um at different levels of government uh but again there are i don't think there are predefined routes um and timelines for how you can grow uh in these roles at uh, roles it's kind of like you know where you are and whether you're there at the right time in order to seize that opportunity and it also depends a lot on the relationships um that you are able to build but also about what you want to get out of the role right, right. for me it was like i rather be at the grassroots level and i rather see what's happening there right. than to be sitting at the state level and looking at a data sheet right um so it's also like you know what your objective is going into that role and what aspect of development or policy making do you want to engage with right yeah absolutely uh right. shudhi uh, before i you know get to the next question uh, you had raised your hand the last time did i miss asking on something um and i did have one tiny thing to add which was you asked a lot about i think building that technical expertise when you're not necessarily from the field i think yeah. that's where that stakeholder management uh, comes into play a lot and that learning mindset which i think literally in the first question people ad- address right if you are able to figure it out such that you have an advisory council or the right resources that's able to guide you or sense check that sector for you so a lot of it is also that network building for yourself yeah. once you do immerse in a space yeah um and i think i mean pretty much that's what the government's doing right building like technical advisory units and stuff is primarily to give you that kind of lens so that was going to be my ringing it answer <laughs> but why don't we continue on that because it was a tech challenge <laughs> no no absolutely in fact that's what i wanted to ask you next and again it's it's a it's a question the answer to which i'm personally invested in knowing as well dasra right and again without getting to any specifics but impact consulting more broadly what does the space look like how does it work it's so wide is all i can say i think um because see basra itself and i'm not going to get into specifics again like impact yeah. consulting may be one part of what they do i think everyone in the space has also diversified okay so what may have started as like advisory and consulting has grown into being a lead partner on a project becoming an incubator uh doing fundraising doing some amount of resource management uh a lot of these spaces are now also becoming uh they they almost have like learning offerings for various stakeholders to try to grow the sector so i would say broadly what does it look like it looks like a lot of overlapping partnerships i i do maybe it's idealistic but i do think that everyone is actually working with everyone else in one way or another um and even if you think of impact consultants right because you took the dasra example who are other names you think of in that space i'm just like Maybe like name a couple top of mind dalberg satwa dalberg bridspan bcg yeah. yeah all of these four and dasra have partnered in one way or another i think just in the last year chase and dasra partnered a little bit as well so okay. it's it's literally it's it's all very overlapping and it's a it's a very i think collaboration driven space 
because everyone is i i guess in a way like lending and bridging each other's gaps right bringing in either a particular skill or a particular perspective and insight yeah. um or in some case build, bringing in a certain network or relationships that law enable everything so yeah. i i do feel like that's a little bit of where it's going and then the rest is is i think nothing new from what we've spoken about it will be uh depending on where you are in the kind of project you're tagged to short mid or long term stints engaging with a particular problem with a particular issue with a particular segment or population group um and kind of applying the same skills across that repeatedly and then even within that there's functional stuff are you an analyst or doing a research kind of side on a role are you more of the the partnerships and stakeholder management person and doing engagements management kind of stuff but right. they, these are a lot of similarities i think you'll see across just applied in different contexts just out of curiosity and maybe sharan and shruti can take this question up together since it's uh, there's an overlap but i'm just taking this name because this is the name i'm most familiar with but for example you know what chase does with clients right on the corporate side uh, in terms of consulting and then what dasra does what is the difference then because these are both institutions into policy space policy sector consulting for corporates right is there a difference at all you want to you want to start <laughs> um i think i mean it's i think the service being provided uh, is is a little different right in the sense that i think perhaps the the specific skill and this is just again my understanding because yeah. and sharan correct me right if i'm getting the list of offerings wrong i think for example with dasra itself uh, at least from what i've seen of of my time there there are certain government relationships and government bodies that we're looking to engage with uh and somewhere the skill and that special expertise that someone like a chase can come in with will be that knowledge of how do you harness that relationship how do you engage at that level Right. building out that kind of government engagement strategy um bringing in that kind of very specific language that works in the policy space on the alternate side i think for example dasra stronghold for a while and at least what it's been best known as in the sector where it started with is a lot of philanthropy yeah so we come in with a bit of that knowledge of how do you tap in networks what are outreach mechanisms what is the kind of content you need yeah. um how do you communicate and put your story across who are the types of partnerships uh you need to build and therefore like how do you project manage uh, that entire piece right um and and similarly i think in some spaces and i've seen this play out differently uh dasra also brings in a lot of networks there is face i think will bring in a lot of that knowledge and uh insight on how to actually go about this space but sharan please i think add on to this uh okay so actually the last thing yeah chase uh, one of our main and this things is actually networks that we end up breaking in right. uh to a very large degree but i guess one fundamental difference would be that dasra would lead a lot of projects and collaborations themselves chase doesn't necessarily lead we right. do base we are client focused right so our work is driven by the client so while dasra might be like this will enable the ecosystem and that's what you're doing in the development sector our work will be more like what is the client really need and if the client needs something and that requires like an ecosystem partnership then you'll go ahead with that right. uh you aren't necessarily thinking of doing that yourself maybe actually we have done a few but uh that's more one off not really uh bread and butter over there yeah. right um i think if i can sorry very quickly 15 seconds a very tactical difference also yeah. and again sharan correct me i know dasra operates primarily as a non profit so i think everything that uh surrounds it will be towards a charitable activity um and so you can't necessarily hire hire dasra as like a service provider on something whereas i believe with chase you can yeah chase is only a service provider we and don't get hired for non profit activity actually we do but like clients can be non profit but the whole idea is that we are a for profit company yeah the next one and i would love you know maybe antar and sanjana to take this up together uh i know that again on this we can't maybe get into specifics but if i look at it correctly right so antara for example the role that you are in right it's advising the government on certain things right consulting with them and maybe 
in a sense, an external capacity partner, if I can put it that way, right? While but the work that you do, Sanjana, right? It's essentially building out capacity in-house for certain kind of tasks, even if on a short-term contract or whatever the case may be, right? Uh, have you, and between the both of you, and if anyone, please feel free to take it up and jump in. Between the both of you, like, have you had experience of how do governments decide that, you know, when do, when do we want to build capacity in-house or maybe, you know, take it from an external partner and what difference does that make? Like if, even if I am someone who's wanting to make that choice, right? That, hey, I want to work with the government, but what's the better route maybe? Like, does it always have to be in-house or maybe just working as a consultant on different projects helps? Like, have you had some exposure to that part of this thing? Um, so in my experience, it's uh, usually when governments are looking at large scale projects, right? Which are over spread over years, actually. Yeah. Uh, we have some projects which are spread over three years, five years. Uh, okay. That is when they sort of look at uh, onboarding an external consultant uh, to be able to do that. Okay. Also, some of these projects, especially um, if it's a central government agency, uh, the locations could be very diverse and sometimes extremely remote as well, including right. the best case example I can think of off the top of my head is smart cities, right? There could be smart cities in practically anywhere in the country. Um, in that case, uh, what we have seen usually is that uh, the client is more comfortable uh, onboarding an external consultant who has uh, that kind of reach and that kind of penetration. And I can talk about the big four in general. Right. We are very, very actively present in tier two, if not tier three as well. Like we have right. active teams sitting out of places like Vijayawada and Vizag and all, all over the place, basically. Telangana and Andhra names coming to my head right now, just based out of Hyderabad. But uh, yeah, we have teams in Raipur, um, Dehradun. So uh, it just makes a lot more sense um, for projects like this to be done by an external consultant. And I think Sanjana can comment on the piece uh, where they are developing capacity in-house. Uh, but just to add there, in certain cases, what we have also seen, and uh, this is from a different team uh, inside of PwC, is that sometimes uh, we are also hired to uh, you know, work around or revamp existing government websites or existing government um, applications, right? Um, yeah. Especially in terms, especially in the UI UX side of things, uh, there are some case studies. Uh, I'm not going to disclose, but yes, yeah. uh, there are there are some examples of uh, opportunities like that, which are uh, you know outsourced to consultants like ourselves. So yes, uh, I believe. Uh, that firstly, it's a case of, you know, reach and manpower, just that mm -hmm. government employees are limited uh, consultants, lots of them all over the place. Uh, and also uh, the ability to go and live there and do the project and do the work. And uh, yeah, that's that's definitely there. Yes. If there's anything you want to add on that, Sanjana? Yeah, I was going to say, you were saying like, you know, how does that need for capacity building come about uh, internally in the government? So, I mean, it's like the government has that inbuilt mandate for capacity building in every program and every scheme. Uh, yeah. You know, a part of the budget is always earmarked for capacity building. It could be 1%, 2%, up to 5%. And that exists at every level of government and in every scheme. And uh, the government also has its own training institutions. So it could be the administrative training institutes that every state is supposed to have. Um, in the education se sector, there's supposed to be teacher training institutes. Um, there's like a national health resource center. There's supposed to be state health resource centers. And similarly, across every sector at different levels, uh, national level, state, district, there's supposed to be all of these training institutes right. um, are supposed to utilize uh, these government budgets and provide this ongoing capacity building. So yeah. the mandate is there. and But what we often see is that they're not able to deliver. And uh, some of the research that the Center for Policy Research and the Accountability Initiative was doing, and I'm sure Shruti is also seeing this through other work that Teach for India may be doing, is that they're not always able to deliver. Um, and that's when government employees start lagging on the capacity building part of it. Sometimes they're not able to find that expertise and external consultants 
uh, could be management consultant. Exactly these teams um, that Antara was talking about, like when I was in Swachh Bharat, they they were teams that were tapped by uh, a management consulting agency who had expertise in building, um, you know, rural sewage management systems. You know, that was an expertise that was not available at that time within the government, especially with a person who was able to leave their day-to-day -day job and instead spend that time um, providing uh, intensive training. So it's a combination of both things, you know, like the government also itself is trying to revive these training institutes, right? Because you have this infrastructure, you have the mandate, you have the funding mechanisms, right. uh, but you sort of let it die out. So there's an ongoing effort to revive it and uh, the whole ecosystem is working towards it. You know, whether it's uh, JPAL, the Poverty Action Lab, they have their own, uh, you know, training programs. Uh, at CPR, we had our own training programs. Right now at the Ministry of Rural Development, we're developing our own um, internal focused training program. So it's a, it's a joint effort and I think it's going to take a lot more, um, you know, to get to where we want to see uh, the government functioning. And just to add to that, uh, because of late, we've been working uh, on some of the curriculum development pieces as well. So as PwC, we are also, you know, currently training training officers at the state level, uh, especially with respect to, uh, you know, managing incubators, yeah. um, looking at uh, handholding uh, entrepreneurs, and I'm not saying startups, entrepreneurs, which could be like a uh, three-person tailoring shop, right, uh, at the last mile uh, in different uh, semi-urban rural areas. We are actually, um, our teams um, not cannot do it as an individual, but uh, we are training those people to be able to uh, get that particular skill set. And these training officers are nominated uh, by the specific uh, government agencies that are the clients there. So yes, we are we are uh, sort of doing that sort of work as well. We ventured into that space as well. Yes. Uh, very insightful. Uh, thank you so much, Sanjay Andhra. Uh, Shruti, maybe uh, this is like burst the bubble sort of a query, but way too many people have this perception, right? And at at, at some level, even I think that to an extent this might be true, which is if you choose to work in the dev sector, are you making a trade off between impact and earnings? Yeah, I had the same questions coming in um, till I think my idea of the sector changed. Like I said, I think I realized um, it's actually a lot wider. And so this, I think, uh, and, and to make it very simple, right? Like even at home, like my my family, we had that very like jhola wala mindset. Like that means you're on the ground doing volunteer work. Yeah. For the time I was in school, it was actually like huh, social work. And then I'm like, no, no, this is a full on full-fledged career with proper skills that's partnering with all the big names you've heard about. So I think just one is I would really change that notion entirely. Yes, there is a trade-off in terms of how much you make, um, but that really is also a factor of where in the space you choose to work. Right. Um, and so I think at least something that's helped me, and this is just a personal thing, is kind of answering these three things in terms of my need, right? Like what's more important to me at a particular time? How much is it paying? What is kind of like my work-life balance or just the culture and well-being aspect of my work or like what is my purpose? And like which one is most important or what combination of these three really matter? And I've made a lot of decisions on that front. At the same time, you have to make very practical decisions. So at least something that I learned in the Amani Fellowship, um, which I did, over last year and a lot of it I think help it, it is a very reflective space like I said a lot of this is actually thinking about what your needs are and what really drives you yep. but pretty much one of the first modules we did was just looking at the dev sector and each of us were like okay this one or two jobs I could do I could work at a non-profit I could work at a funder and we actually unpacked that there are about 10 or 12 different entities across which you could work and within that even based on the function you're in there are different pay scales Wonderful. So right. there's a wide variety. And, and I think based on how important that aspect is for you or like, I guess what range within which you're willing to work, you will have a good spectrum of opportunities available to you. The other thing at least that I'm seeing, and I know TFI personally did this, is, is a lot more, I think, uh, thought and intention and budgeting going around actually 
uh, compensation um, because I think the sector is also trying to realize that very skilled talent is coming in and to kind of keep it there, we do need to make this a sustainable space to stay. So yeah. um, I, I would say it's gotten a lot better. Awesome. I think uh, before we, you know, a final round of questions and here's how, how I want to put this because we have discussed this to an extent already, which is about, you know, core skills for, again, the kind of people that we are targeting this uh, conversation for, right, is people who are just in university about to graduate and about to start building a career. And they want to hear from the best of, you know, uh, how do they build careers in this specific niche? Either, uh, and I'll start with you, Sanjana, right, especially given in particular the kind of technical background that's needed for the kind of job that you do, right? Uh, either you can let me know if, you know, what does a day in your job life look like, right? So people can have some idea of, you know, what to expect if they get into the sector or, and, or, or some of the key skills you would recommend that they pick up if they want to build your, a, a career. Yeah. Um, so it changes depending on what level of government you're engaging with and what kind of research you're doing, Yeah. Um, depending on whether you're inside or outside, but if you're engaging directly with program implementation, um, like I had said earlier, like, right. And you had also asked like how much of this is data driven. Yeah. And if you're directly engaged in program implementation in the government these days, like probably the first thing you're going to do is look at that MIS, right? Like see what has your progress been against the targets that has set, what is your daily progress look like? Um, you're probably going to have um, messages rolling in on your WhatsApp group, um, related to your scheme, whether it's from the higher level, whether it's from your colleagues at the same level, um, there's going to be some urgent request um, that needs to be addressed like ASAP. Um, so if you're working on the program implementation side in government, there's a lot of like firefighting and like ad hoc kind of work, you know, things that urgently have to be dealt with right now. And that's sort of like what you start your day with. Right. Um, and then there are longer term projects that you, you know, may be going on uh, at the back on the back burner or uh, maybe something that you're pursuing side by side. It could be an innovative project that you want to implement, um, you know, a, a new way of uh, implementing that you want to try out. So it, it's a combination of those two things. So program implementation on a day to day basis of firefighting and then trying to balance it with what your actual program goals are. Um, and you know, you have to figure your way, uh, out through that. Yeah. That that's very helpful. Uh, maybe Sharan and you want to take up the bit on consulting figure that, that, you know, how does a typical day look like consulting almost seems like this one enigma, to be honest, the number of times I've been asked this, uh, across spaces. So how does a day look like for a policy consultant? Right. And if, I know we have answered the skills part already, which is soft skills, but if there's anything that you want to add onto it, maybe Sharan first, and then we can go with Antara next. Okay. Uh, skills to succeed. I think that's, uh, I'd break it down to two things only, maybe three problem solving. Second would be empathy. I think that is key. And I don't mean it from a space of you have to be compassionate about everyone. I mean, you need to really understand every single person you're dealing with. You're dealing with clients, you're dealing with, uh, government, you're dealing with your team, you're dealing with other partners in the space, you want to understand everyone's incentives at play. You want to understand where they are coming from. You want to understand their context. Yeah. Once you learn how to understand and once you learn why, where, what constraints they are operating under, then you just need to learn how to communicate with them. So three parts, identify the problem, empathize with everyone, communicate correctly. That's about it. Antara, if you want to take up like I think uh, yeah, just adding to that, um, take initiative. Uh, do not uh, again these firms uh, typically the big four are slightly hierarchy driven. Don't uh, sort of stop at designation. That does not mean anything. Uh, you should always aspire to work uh, yeah. beyond your designation. Um, so definitely take more initiative. Uh, if you're perceived as aggressive, don't you know sort of stop that from uh, becoming a roadblock to uh, pursuing any opportunity or project because again at the end of the day and I keep telling this to people that no one's going to give you an opportunity you have to put yourself out there and uh, make the best of it so yes definitely uh, these two things and if you perceive yourself and I'm using the word perceive uh, very specifically here because I used to be one of those people if you perceive yourself as an introvert um, then maybe change that uh, slightly to begin with. 
because you are on a daily basis talking and talking and talking uh, so yeah. definitely that is something uh, and if that exhausts you well then uh, probably you don't want to uh, venture into the space and lastly yes the ability to say no um, that i think is critical across any kind of job role that you have in the space like sanjana was mentioning there'll be like a lot of urgent requests ad hoc work that will come that will come from superiors that will be offloaded onto you if you're the newest person in the team um, just the ability to say no um, will take you a long way yes i think that's very important yeah sudeep if you want to uh, take that on for the that space sure um i think actually everyone summed up a lot of what i resonate with right firefighting communication um a lot of that people element it's so important because you do need to influence and get people to cooperate yeah. something i will add is actually continuous learning um because i think it's it's really important to keep and and i think this this will touch upon is like something you'll find right like it's a lot of what you make of it uh in this space it's not a space where there's like one direct pathway to something uh, yeah. and there are many options and the way people work is constantly changing and innovating as more and more people get involved in development and get involved in in like a systems change kind of view um and and so i think that continuous learning and continuously upskilling is 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 really really important and i i, I can't stress that enough and the more you apply the more you'll do that um the second aspect i think is sorry and continuous learning you can actually do through fellowships executive courses taking a break Absolutely. sabbatical stretch projects all of that even yeah. even just learning conversations like these right i feel like i picked up a lot from it um the second piece i would say is and at least i felt this a lot um it's a very kind of value and belief led space just by nature on the things you're yeah, working on you're yeah. a lot more likely to bring your personal values and beliefs to it um and so i think double clicking on what antra said also which is a bit of that well being push like right? just balance your time and your energy because you need to be able to bring it to work um yeah i think those those are two big ones uh that i would kind of place in addition to what everyone has already said I've I've had a very, especially compared to everyone here, my career hasn't even begun. I've just been here for three years, but couldn't agree more on that one point that this is so much of a people's business. Like, it's just a people's business. If you're good with people, if you can, you can just get so much done. Everything else you can learn from graphic design to coding. Honestly, that's the easier part. Just so absolutely. The last question for today, and this is something Andhra, Shruti, and Sanjana can together take up. Uh, Personally speaking, like I've had the greatest fortune of having only female bosses all my career. Again, just three years, but the most fantastic people I know, and I've learned from them every single day. My question is, as a woman, and you know, as some who's trying to build a career in this space, do you think? I mean, in what shape and form, uh, you feel there have been barriers, just owing to you know, your gender or like has has that acted as a roadblock? Is there a way you've gone about it? Is there anything you want to share on that? can i go yeah they mentioned the aggressive point earlier right um it's more of a so okay i'll give you a rough statistic for you to understand what it looks like so at the manager level which is an l5 and a partner being an l8 uh, if there are 200 odd promotions in the india firm 50 are women uh, the rest are men right so as you go up the pyramid is like that Yeah. and in my current team there is uh, no woman above the level of a manager right now <laughs> yes and it's a 60 people team uh, as far as i remember right so um definitely i do feel uh, not that i have experienced it personally uh, per se because like um, no obligations so far no liabilities uh, so far no one dependent on me so far but uh, Yes, I do see people uh, being perceived in a different way uh, when they express their uh, desire to get married, have kids, uh, or they want a flexible arrangement so that they could spend more time back with their families. Uh, it's changing a little bit for the better because you know the pandemic showed us how things can be managed in a completely of online, if not like a hybrid model at best. But yes, of course, uh, consulting being relatively travel heavy um 
if you're someone that's not willing to do that every week or every two yeah. weeks uh, at the least, uh, opportunities start uh, dwindling for you. Um, and again, uh, this is not something that I would like to put across as an excuse because you're entering consulting knowing that it's travel intensive. And of course, uh, very, very little chance of a work-life balance. So unless you're in love with it, uh, you're not there. But yes, I would like to see the space becoming a lot more uh, woman-friendly uh, than it is right now. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, maybe I can go next because I've had kind of the opposite experience in that even my current team and the team I was on before were entirely female-led. Uh, it's been a very energizing space. So I personally have felt also very just lucky and like I've learned a lot yeah. from that. But literally my last team was 100% women and my current team has, I think, like two men <laughs> and 15 women, you know. So it, it's been kind of the opposite, but a lot of the things still do apply in that I think that diversity and inclusion and I think equity around that is also a journey uh, and different people are at different points in it right and so I think it's even in some of the stuff I do now which is stuff like um, gender policy and all of that at least for the organization it's a lot of identifying where is the organization where do you want to be and then like what's the first baby step to it so I do feel like at least the space I'm in has been able to take a few more of those steps but there's still a long way to go in that a lot of what you find is okay, there are more safe spaces, there's more things that you can just speak about um, very openly, a lot more of that respect, you don't feel that divide, you you see yourself in senior roles, um, and you can, you know, it's, it's a very real thing in front of you. Yeah. Um, at the same time, I did feel like at least one of the things that I felt for a while and with my peer group, like none of us actually learned to negotiate with confidence or just kind of put forth what we wanted and it took a lot of unlearning to be like no that is actually a demand I can make I don't have yeah. to be apologetic or kind of um, reserved about everything for the sake of coming across as like demanding or, or bossy there's a way to have influence and authority without aggression um, and, and I think a space at least that like I've been thinking about a lot is also actually uh, I, I think this workplaces for new mothers because I still do think that that's actually a challenge and a gap. And even if there are policies and stuff around it, the reality of the situation plays out very differently. Yeah. Um, awesome. Uh, yeah, um, my turn. Um, so in my personal experience, some of the bosses and work environments I've had within government have been better than what I've had outside government. And... Sometimes it could be like a stereotype of a typical like Sarkari Nokri, right? Like there is that work-life balance. You're not working all nighters unless of course some like politician is coming to visit and there really is something that you have to finish off right then, you know, unless there's a crisis, yeah. um, there's a disaster situation or something, you're not going to be working 24 seven. There isn't, you know, you're not a profit driven enterprise. Um, you are answerable to beneficiaries, but to a limit, right? You know, that that's a stereotype of a Sarkari Nokri and uh, it, it has that, gives you that space and flexibility. And some of the bosses that I've had in the government system have been absolutely amazing um, and supportive. But on the other hand, there are some very practical things, right? That uh, can make your day-to-day -day working in that system very uncomfortable. Uh, whether it could be like seeing no other women around um, at lower levels of government, um, in technical roles, especially engineering driven teams, again, very few women there and a very male dominated and driven space, you may not get, you know, you may not see any other women in meetings for days on end, or you may not get a chance to speak um, in a meeting, no one will ask you about your opinion, you may be brushed over um, and even more, you know, like a practical experience wise, in lower levels of government, you may not have a functioning toilet. You know, how do you function just in that day-to-day -day aspect? Um, and uh, again, then on the outside also, like there are in the development sector, there are many teams and organizations that are very uh, female driven, but even there, like things like the gender pay gap are like real, right? Like the fact that your salary information is not made public and you're discouraged to speak about it, like 
yeah. and you're discouraged from negotiating like you know impact you like and that compounds year on year as you continue working in those jobs um and um, you know i over the past couple of years i've been seeing the work that like organizations especially with regard to like diversity right there may be just yeah. a particular kind of woman who you know understands particular types of problems who may be in those leadership positions so even when we're looking at at women in these positions how diverse is it is it just one particular type of upper class upper caste woman who is leading and seeing you know problems that women are facing with their blinkers on and these are the only problems that women are facing or are they more inclusive uh, beyond that right so there are groups like um equity and policy education or helping people from underrepresented backgrounds and you know oppressed backgrounds looking at getting into uh, you know policy higher degree courses um there's bahujan economist looking at the field of economics yeah um and how exclusionary it can be and uh, similarly in policy spaces and uh, with respect to this gender pay gap and like negotiation and getting into different positions um i've also been engaging with women in economics and policy and they have been doing like absolutely fantastic work like conducting surveys to collate this information about like promotions about uh salaries you know about how to get into these jobs and like disseminating that information and like actively engaging through like mentorship programs and stuff so you know there is a bright side to all of this like you can see this change happening you can see people like pushing against it and then you can see development organization uh, organizations partnering back yeah. with bahujan economists with the women in economics and policy to say like how do we make our organizations um, more inclusive how do we uh, yeah. improve our working conditions so it's it's good to see that change happening this is this is very helpful uh shameless self plug but at pti as well it's an all women team if you keep me aside i mean they're the ones doing all the phenomenal work anyways but it's generally you know a focus area for us that uh, i'm not sure you know how was the panel is across the work that we do but in general for our audiences as well if you go to the website and you know all the careers work that we do right it's generally focus on how do we get more people in the space and with a focus on for folks from tier 2 backgrounds or women and what have you so nonetheless this has been a phenomenal conversation and to be very honest i have learned so much forget anything else so just want to thank you so much for in the middle of a work week for taking out the time on a wednesday evening uh really grateful for for this opportunity to have this conversation uh and for our audiences we will leave the links for, you know for the linkedin profiles and uh, some of the brilliant work that everyone here has done in the show notes please feel free to reach out to everyone here right and i'm sure that they'll be very happy to answer and help out in whatever ways that we can uh thank you for joining in and we'll catch with you very soon